Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Commute Back Better, uh, making zero carbon commuting a reality webinar. Uh, this event is part of the Real Zero, uh, Real Zero in a Hurry Decarbonate International Conference, uh, and really want to thank you for joining us today. Now, I say webinar; it's actually a Zoom meeting, so it's a bit more uh, a bit more personal than a, than a webinar. So uh, welcome, and you're all you're all uh, kind of uh, welcome to join us, and, and we we hope to hear from you shortly. Uh, my name is Mark Dobar. I'm the director in the Future Mobility team at NatWest Group. Uh, and this afternoon, I'm joined by some excellent guest speakers. We have Ali Claburn, the founder and CEO of the LiftShare Group uh, and Mobility Ways. Sandra Witzel, board member of Maz Tech provider Skedgo and co-founder of the Women's Mobility Hub. Georgia Yexley, head of cities at TIR, the first micromobility company to be fully climate neutral. And Natalia Peralta Silverstone, head of propositions at Octopus EV. They'll share more about themselves shortly when they come on to deliver their presentations. But the format for the next 50 minutes will be as follows. In a moment, I'll share with you uh, how we at NatWest Group are approaching the subject of net zero commuting. Uh, I'll then invite each of the guest speakers to deliver their presentations on how they support the challenge of zero carbon commuting. And this will take us through till about 4.15. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, transport is the biggest greenhouse gas emitter here in the UK. But did you know that it accounts for 25, commuting accounts for 25% of this? Commuting emissions make up 18 billion kilograms of CO2e, which is 5% of the UK's total emissions. In England, around 60% of one to two mile trips are made by car. 10 billion kilograms of CO2 could be saved if people commuted by walking, cycling, public transport or car sharing. This is equivalent to London's carbon emissions for almost four months. Whilst COVID has had a negative impact on so much of our day-to-day -day lives since March last year, we could easily argue that we did see a positive by way of change of behaviour when it came to commuting. Over the last 18 months, we've seen local authorities implement cycling infrastructure to support key workers getting to and from work. The same infrastructure has enabled people to feel safe and get back on bikes to support their own mental well-being. This in turn has seen people wanting to start commuting in a more sustainable way. And of course, the implementation of lockdowns saw much improved air quality in many towns and cities across the UK. But we are arguably now at a crossroads. Many organisations, my own included, are starting to implement return to workplaces across the country. And with COVID still lurking, public transport not deemed safe by everyone, and some reversal of safe cycling infrastructure by local authorities, we we're at a real risk of losing all the benefits that we were seeing 12 months ago. But it isn't too late. I think we have time to act. And if you read the IPCC report uh, recently published, you know we have to act. Uh, and it's therefore on all of us to act and find a better way of utilising transport. If we all started by focusing on how we do that for our commute, then it's definitely going to be a step in the right direction and make a positive impact. Hopefully the next 90 minutes will give you some great insight into how we might do that. So without further ado, what are NatWest doing? Uh, and I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully this is going to come through any second now. Okay, so uh, achieving net zero commuting. One of the questions I often get asked is why is the bank involved? What's NatWest doing playing in this space? Well, climate is at the core of our purpose-led strategy, a strategy launched by uh, our CEO at the beginning of last year. The Future Mobility Group uh, that I'm part of is noted as a key driver to accelerating the speed of transition and addressing climate change impacted by all forms of transport. Uh, and as I just said shortly a moment ago, you know, transport is the biggest greenhouse gas emitter. That's why the bank took the decision to, uh, to, to make a team really focus on this and, 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 and be, in, be enthused to do this. So uh, why focus on commuting? It's every employer's obligation. Uh, as Future Mobility Group, part of NatWest, you know, NatWest has 50,000 staff across the UK. We have 19 million customers. So it's on us to do all we can to help our staff uh, and our customers think about commuting. Uh, and that commuting comes from car journeys, single occupancy car journeys, public transport and active travel. Uh, and, and we're trying, uh, as, as we go about our daily business, to, to try and educate our customers, educate our staff on what, what we mean by commuting and, and what they can do to improve things in this space. 
So how do you think about decarbonisation of commuting? Make the best of what is already out there is a, is a key start. You know, encourage active travel. Uh, engage staff um, and active travel and engage staff uh, you know talk to them about uh, bike to work schemes do you have a bike to work scheme is that something that you could implement engage staff is really around health lifestyle climate the company impact uh, and making your staff aware of, of, of commuting being an, a, a, I guess you know a greenhouse gas emitter and, and contributing to your business's uh, greenhouse gases Leverage 2020 benefits um, where reasonable. You know, 2020, lots and lots of us, most of us probably work from home. Um, and, and I guess we can't lose those benefits. We will return to offices, as we've already talked about, but, but we need to try and leverage some of those benefits that we saw last year. And, and data. Data is something we really need to think about. Location, services, colleagues. You know, there are businesses, certainly a lot of our customers aren't possibly potentially big enough to, to kind of focus in this on their own. You know, can they collaborate with neighbours? Can they ca collaborate with, you know, other businesses on their on business parks or industrial estates where they are uh, and really start to think about that? How do you kind of work on that? Um, clearly, we'd love everybody to be active travel and public transport users, but people do you need to use the car. You know, there are people who, who the car has to be the way they commute to work. So electrification does play a huge part and, and that's uh, you know, high on our agenda in, in the group. Uh, and, and plot solutions like bike share, lift share, company car schemes uh, and, and infrastructure. Uh, there's some of the things that we're doing and I'll go into that in a moment of what we're focused on. So, so what are we doing? How are uh, we supporting our staff in that West? Well, uh, you know, one of the first commitments we, we did to sign up to the Climate Group EV100. We have a salary sacrifice company car scheme. Uh, we've had that for quite some time, um, but now you can only uh, purchase hybrid and electric vehicles on those schemes. You cannot get an internal combustion engine vehicle. Uh, we have a colleague car scheme for, for, for members of staff that aren't eligible for the salary sacrifice uh, and we're starting to push EV and hybrid more in, in, in that scheme as well. We have uh, 300 job needs cars uh, across the group and we've transitioned all of those to EV uh, and to support staff with their transition to electric vehicles we're installing at the moment we're, we're installing 600 charge points across our, uh, our estate uh, right across the UK. To help with that we are developing uh, an app that works with our our staff's um, ID card, their, their pass that gets them into buildings. Uh, and we're working on a staff telematics proposition. Uh, we announced to the public last week, we've um, sponsored the EV8 diagnostic app that's gone to market. Uh, that's sponsored by NatWest. Uh, and we're developing a staff only proposition that, that supports that as well. Uh, I'm glad Natalia is on here because we have a partnership with Octopus Energy. We're the first bank to, to uh, partner with the charge point operator. Uh, and we're now bringing some of the benefits that Octopus bring when it comes to charge points for electric vehicles uh, and, and, and other ancillary kind of energy products as well. So we're working there. Uh, one of the key things that we pushed last year was improving our cycle to work scheme um, to, to 3000 pounds. Uh, previously, like m many businesses, it was a thousand and, and that doesn't really cater for an e-bike or, or an e-bike of any quality or standard. So, so we've pushed that up. Uh, if COVID hadn't kicked in, we should have been piloting with Zelo uh, last year for our global he headquarters in Edinburgh. Um, so hopefully as we return to work sort of later this year and, and into 2022, we'll be re reinstating that. Uh, and we have a pilot in progress across Scotland with mobility ways, which I know Ali is, is very pleased about. Um, you know, we are looking at how do we enable better staff choices for commuting? How do we replicate that across the UK for the benefit of all our other staff? So that's what we're doing for our staff. What are we doing for customers? Uh, there is a real kind of focus on engagement, education and propositions. So internal training uh, for our, our, our customers, um, looking at that, de delivering customer roundtables, building go green hubs for our retail and our commercial customers, driving events, um, uh, setting up events to drive awareness of climate and the changing transport landscape. Uh, and we are working on carbon calculators and action planning for customers and developing propositions through partnerships uh, like the one we have with Octopus that help our customers make better climate transport. So uh, I'll skip through this slide um, and, and just quickly move on. So the challenges to net zero commuting, individuals, uh, if we start at the top, you know, it's an individual's choice to change commuting practices. Um, it's not the corporate's choice. 
we can do as much as we can, but we, we, it's the individual that does that. So culturally, we need to think about how we, how we change that. You do need data to support the change. Uh, mm. And I know Ali and his team can support with that. COVID has had an impact on commuting, both positively and negatively. We need to make sure we um, maintain the, uh, the positives. Infrastructure, anything. I've been working in future mobility for 18 months now. Anything and every solution comes back to infrastructure and the challenge around infrastructure. Um, so it's really key that we, we kind of work with local authorities uh, and, and think about that, that infrastructure that supports active travel. Uh, we need to kind of look at the cost myths and the true carbon footprints of EVs. Uh, there's lots of negative press around EVs. There is a lot of positives for them as well. Uh, and there's a real kind of battle going on on social media campaigns at the moment around the, the pros and the cons. And, and we need to, to kind of look at that. Um, uh, and uh, is MAS really a viable solution? Uh, obviously, we're going to hear from uh, Skedgo shortly. Um, but, but is MAS a really a viable solution? Has it really taken off um, uh, in the UK? That I guess is a question we need to ask. So in summary, from a NatWest perspective, it's every employer's obligation to focus on net zero commuting. Measuring and reporting scope three emissions will be mandatory. We shouldn't waste the opportunity that COVID has presented us. There's still much that we can all do to drive net zero commuting and collaboration partnerships will be key to overcoming the challenges we face. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. That's what NatWest are doing. Um, without further ado, uh, I'm gonna hand over to Ali Claben and uh, let Ali tell us all about Mobility Ways. Thank you, Mark. Can you just put your thumbs up if that's now sharing? Perfect. Afternoon all, um, huge thanks to Mark uh, for the introduction and a massive thanks to the team who've put on the event this week. I've been lucky enough to be at a few of the sessions. I started off planning to go to one, I ended up going to four. I've learned loads, so if you didn't watch them, look back when they're on recorded that some of the academics are doing some incredible work in this space right now it's super exciting so i do encourage you to have a look um quick introduction my name is ali Clavin. i'm a social entrepreneur i've been dedicated to decarbonizing transport and specifically the commute for the last 22 years um i've learned loads we've made loads of got loads of stuff wrong we've got a few things right so i'm delighted to be here today with this topic uh, particularly because it focuses on doing this in a hurry we really haven't got long we've got to sort this out quickly um, and uh, it's great to see the other speakers. I'm looking forward to learning from them too. Uh, so how do we make zero carbon commuting a reality as quickly as possible? Um, Mark has already said this, but I think it is worth reiterating. The commute is the single largest source of emissions in the UK. It's flatlined for the last 30 years. Despite all the improvements in vehicles, it hasn't got any better. Uh, because people have been commuting often further and we've had more commuters so we have to do something and if we fail on this we will fail our net zero goals and if we fail our net zero goals our children simply won't forgive us we have an opportunity right now uh, to make a massive difference and i think it's down to all of us to really give it this a proper go um i've heard a lot about data this week and i thought it's really important to start off with some data because data can uh, give you some essential essential insights but it can also lead you up the wrong path and I just want to share an example of this uh, with everybody. So here is a graph showing the commute distances of over 500,000 commutes that we've analysed at Mobility Ways. Uh, and this is specifically showing the distances. So clearly you can see that there are a huge number, or most of the journeys are shorter journeys. So all of these ones could in theory be walked or cycled, a lot of journeys. Uh, the next band is the typical kind of distances that are, that are very suitable for traveling by bus. We've got high densities of people and, and shorter routes. Um, so in theory, you can target a lot of people in these areas. And that's probably why there's so much policy at the moment around active travel and public transport. Both totally needed. But when you look at where the emissions come from, does this graph correlate to where the emissions come from? That's the question. And here's the answer. No. Very simply, the, the, the action going on to try and target the shorter car journeys, absolutely essential. If we can walk and cycle them, we should do. So we have that there are emissions coming from them, but uh, uh, only 17% of all car emissions come from journeys that are less than five miles. 17%. That means 83% come from journeys that are longer than five miles. And typically those journeys are not uh, uh, are too far to walk and cycle and don't have viable public transport uh, options available to them. Hence why the car is seen as king 
and hence why we need to do all we can to a decarbonize the vehicles and also decarbonize how we use those vehicles or to cut those emissions as fast as possible because if we don't focus on these journeys we will again fail our net zero uh, goals um so this summer the government announced their transport decarbonization plan and when I saw the draft of the plan, I was pretty shocked and horrified that it missed some very key things. But uh, for once, the government seemed to listen to feedback and fundamentally changed it in, before they released the final outcome. And we were delighted uh, that the commute was put in there and the role of businesses in decarbonizing transport. We've always seen uh, employers as playing a massive, potentially playing a massive role in this and having had some incredibly uh, big successes with lift sharing over the years and seeing clients uh, get their commuting emissions down by 30 or 40 percent. Um, we think that uh, employers can play a significant role in this area. And so seeing when the government say we will work with large employers on measuring and reporting their total emissions uh, and remove any barriers preventing organisations from reducing these, that is a massive tick. Um, they are fully committed to it. The issue with the TDP was there was a lack of specific targets. However, I've been on the phone the last couple of weeks to the transport, uh, to the DFT and uh, they have now have teams of people who are starting to work on this. So I'm hugely hopeful that they are taking this as seriously as they say they're in the document, which is great. So what levers are there to employers, to councils, to governments in terms of decarbonising commute? Simply, there are three. We can reduce the demand for commuting by encouraging more people to work from home. We can shift the vehicles that are on the commute to being lower emissions vehicles, to being EVs and to getting many more people actively travelling. Uh, or and or we can increase the occupancy and the utilization of vehicles on the roads through lift sharing, van pooling and buses. And it's really important to look at buses as being high occupancy vehicles because uh, there's a perception that buses and public transport is good and cars and private transport is bad. The average car with 1.6 people in it is just as efficient as the average bus in terms of grams per kilometer currently. Uh, the average bus will take 55 people but only has eight people on it. And very often they're going fairly full one way and empty in the other. We need to increase the occupancy of buses, not just increase buses. We need to increase the occupancy of cars, and we certainly don't want to increase the number of cars. And in fact, we only need about 20% of the, all the vehicles we've got on the roads right now. So in terms of the UK fleet, we've got to have a smaller fleet, and those, that fleet has got to go less miles, and the miles that are driven have to be shared a lot more. Um, whereas at the moment they're not. So just in the rush hour in the mornings, there are 47 million empty seats every morning, and there are only 15 million people who commute. So there's plenty of empty seats in the cars. You don't actually need any public transport or walking and cycling. You could just get people in cars, but clearly uh, we need to make better use of this. And this is a crazy situation uh, when also there are many people struggling to be able to afford to travel to work at the moment. Um, historically, um, my team have focused on the commute and there are lots of uh, success stories. Uh, Ocado, uh, just one of them, uh, they set up the lift scheme primarily to help them with their recruitment, helping more people share cars to get to work. But in the process, within the space of a couple of years, i.e. very quickly, managed to get a huge percentage of their staff signed up and to be saving 500 tonnes of CO2 every year, which is massive. At the same time, saving £300,000. Not bad for, for a quick initiative. But more recently, the last couple of years, we've been focusing on the mobility ways project and this is much broader this is cross covers the whole commute and I thought I'd take you through a quick case study just to give you an idea of how it, how it works so uh, the NHS um, actually leading in the area in terms of setting clear targets they want a net zero national health service which is great the commute accounts for 780,000 tons of CO2 in the NHS it is one of the biggest source of emissions in the NHS so they have to do something and James Paget Hospital are one of the early movers in this space so historically what have they done they like many companies do the occasional travel survey. Uh, actually, it's become a bit out of favour. They hadn't done one for several years, but this was their most recent travel survey that showed that over 80% of their staff drove alone to work. This is fairly typical. Um, what they would typically do when doing a travel plan would also maybe look at where people are travelling from, maybe plot a map. Um, it's great to see the data shine commute tool this week, showing people travelling from uh, LSOA, uh, postcode area, basically to postcode area. Gives a good indication of where people are coming from, but it isn't really... Uh, making the most of the data and the insights you can get. And when you look at their, when you look at their data, um, as you'll see in a bit, only 1% or 2% of their staff were traveling by bus, whereas you'll see in a moment that many more could be. So what we try and do is take all the lessons from what's going on in the tech space at the moment and 
taking, say, Amazon as an example, and asking you the question, would you be happy if your delivery van drop your parcel off somewhere in your LSOA? So somewhere in your postcode area, rather than at your door. Or how about they picked it up from somewhere random and dropped it off somewhere random? That's effectively how transport has been modelled for the last 20, 30 years. We look at trends from area to area. The modern day world, and the reason all these tech companies are doing so well is they focus on individuals. They focus on door to door users, individual users. So we need to make sure that the transport sector wakes up to this. And we don't just focus on area to area, we focus on individuals and exact locations. And that's effectively what we tried to do at Mobility Way. So we, our whole focus is on making zero carbon key reality, but we put individuals right at the heart of that. We want to be absolutely commuter centric in terms of helping commuters understand all their options. So we start off very simply with, with surveying them, asking them, finding out how they travel, how they used to travel, how they want to travel. We then uh, move that into uh, very clear visuals. So this example is not only on the right hand side showing that their total emissions are 2 million uh, kilos of CO2, but on the left hand side, it's showing uh, how many are high emission commuters, i.e. car drivers, how many are mid, mid uh, so bus and lift sharing, and how many are, are active travel. So this is what they're currently doing. And if you look at their like bus numbers, uh, which you won't be able to see because it'll be tiny, uh, but it's like a few percent. However, the next thing we do is we take all those individuals and we plot uh, where they live and then look at all the travel modes available to that individual, not to a group of people, but to that individual. And then we can see that in this case, 39% uh, uh, of people can walk or cycle to the hospital, but currently only 15% are. So there's a huge latent capacity for that. Uh, we could see that 55% of people could use public transport, but only 3% are. Again, why? Uh, and 95% of people could lift share, but only like 10% or whatever it were. So there's a huge latent capacity change. Um, we can also then use the data to work with FIRST, which we're doing in this case, FIRST buses, to say, well, you've got really good routes along key corridors, but actually if you also go along this corridor and this corridor, you can pick up a load of people, bring, bring, them, bring them in. And you also need to market your services to these individuals so they know that you're available. Um, we can also use a tool to see which operators there. So in terms of who should James Paget Hospital speak to when looking at um, uh, trying to get better services into their, their sites. And clearly for, for them here, first are the main operators. So that's who they're talking to. Uh, and in terms of lift sharing, for them, not only do they have 90% uh, of people with um, uh, lift sharing option, but 81% uh, of those people, 81% of all their staff have at least 10 people that they could share a car with within walking distance of the house. So huge potential for sharing, which starts to look at, should we be doing van pooling services? Should we be having bigger cars, bigger vehicles to bring more people into the site? Um, and then all of this is about trying to make it accessible, not just to the person doing the plan, but to their, to their managers and to the senior decision makers, so they can actually see what is useful and what they should be doing to get on path to, to net zero. Um, ASIL is a key tool. So ASIL is, is a tool that helps every company um, benchmark their average commuter emissions level. So it's a really simple tool. So irrespective of how many staff you've got, in this case, the 719 says that the average commuter at this employer emits 719 kilos of carbon per person. To get down to zero by 2040, they've got to get halfway by 2030. So their goal is to work, work build a strategy to get them halfway down to, to net zero by 2030. Uh, so initially it'll be looking at improving the bus services to the site, walking and cycling. Year two, it'll be lift sharing. When they start getting all, the, all of those uh, levels up, they'll then start looking at introducing EVs, plug-in plug uh, locations, and potentially introducing like van pool services, all in line with getting down to net zero by 2040. So taking them as a hospital, what did this show? Well, it showed that A, the commute accounts for 25% of all their emissions, huge. 95% um, of the staff have a green travel option available. 80% of their staff were driving alone to work before this. So a huge opportunity to change. Very simply, they can implement um, a few simple measures and get their communication up and work with the local operators uh, to uh, really start making a difference. They've got to get their emissions down by at least 5% a year, and we totally think it's, it's achievable. Um, in terms of the, the progress of the whole project moving forward, it's, it's scaling up really fast now. We've got some amazing um, employees on board. It's great to be working with Mark and his team, also doing some really cool work with um, Amazon and Sky and lots of hospitals. It, it's very cool. Um, but it's just so good that finally the commute is being recognized as a, as a source of emissions and something that we can really tackle together. If you're a local authority and you want um, some groovy maps, look at the Mobility Series website. There's uh, areas showing you um, what your local ASIL score is, and we can go right down into LSOA area two if you wanted to. 
Um, and just finally, in terms of car occupancy, because it's really important, it's also in the TDP, this line in here saying, if we increase car occupancy from the average of 1.55 to 1.7, that will save 3 million tonnes of carbon, um, which is the equivalent of all the emissions coming from the bus, buses. So imagine the benefits or the costs of, of shifting all buses to being EVs and how much that will cost compared to the behaviour change campaign needed to get us from an average occupancy of 1.55 to 1.7. I would argue that clearly there's a need to do both, uh, but the quick win is, is in increasing car occupancy. And the challenge to us all is how low can we go and how fast? Thank you all, and I look forward to the questions. Oh, thank you, Ali. Uh, and if we could just hold for the questions till we've had all of the presentations from the guest speakers. Um, but thank you, Ali. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be a sales champion for you. Uh, it's been excellent working with you uh, and the team. And, and not only that, you know, we had a meeting with some of your team earlier today to talk about what you could do for our customer base. So, uh, you know, I could, can really advocate what, what you're doing. Um, but thank you for that. Uh, Sandra, could we hand over to yourself? Sandra Whitzel. Sure. Um, thank you, Mark. And thanks, Ali, for that, that really fascinating presentation and all the, all the great data you shared. Um, so my name is Sandra Witzel. I'm the CMO and board member of Skedgo. We are a mobility as a service platform provider. So we're a technology company and we license our software to governments, uh, corporations and startups to create their own uh, mobility as a service solutions and and one of them is is corporate mobility as well for example and I'll, I'll dive a bit more into what mobility as a service can do um let me share my screen with you hang on okay can you see my screen Okay, so the commute. Now, my hypothesis is that the commute has been screwed way before COVID. And I'll tell you why. So as a marketer or any good marketer worth their salt will tell you to start any kind of, not just campaign, but product development, or in our case, transport system development, you do a deep dive into the target audience and you really try and understand the target audience. Now, the problem with the commute is, and that was a problem we had long before COVID, a lot of the commuter systems are based on a very outdated model of society where we have a nuclear family living in the suburbs and the wife stays at home, looks after the kids and the husband drives to work and then drives back home from his workplace. And that's how a lot of our transport systems were, were built. And um, that totally neglected the travel behavior of half of the population, for example, because um, data was not aggregated, uh, was aggregated and was not separated by gender. So all this um, data that we have now on how women travel, for example, shows they have quite different travel patterns and they commute in a way that is quite different to how we built those systems in the past. So we found that um, women walk more, they use more public transport. Um, sometimes that's because they're poorer, but also because they have um, different needs. They still do most of the unpaid care work so they do more what we call trip chaining. They um, combine more transport modes with each other. So they might walk, take the bus because they have to go to um, healthcare appointments, pick up children, look after the elderly, do the grocery shopping, etc., And then um, also do work. Quite often they, they do more part-time work because they have to do all these things um, on top. So they show different behavior to that drive to work from the home and then drive back home from the workplace. It's just not the reality for a large part of our population. And, and um, that was a big problem with, with commuting. And COVID, I think, has really highlighted that because suddenly this behavior has almost completely broken down. And we see that in some of the statistics where, for example, this, is, um, this just came out from the rail delivery group. Um, trains have lost their commuters because people are just not going into work anymore. And they're behaving more like a lot of women have behaved for quite a long time before that. 
So, so the system has really broken down now and we need to find ways to, to create a different system that really fits our modern society better, that includes women in how we develop these new systems, because we're not going to go back to commuting the way it was set up before. It's just not going to happen because of the, the larger amount of um, people working from home, only going to the office two days a week, if that, things have really changed and, and we need to adapt with them. And I think that's a really great opportunity to make transport better um, and, and also make it more accessible and inclusive. We've got a real opportunity here to change the system and look at target audiences that we've neglected in the past that have the same right to an independent car free, net zero commute than anyone else. They just have slightly different needs than another part of the population. So we, we really need to drill down into the data a bit more and see how do people actually travel? What are their needs? Can they, even if we throw micromobility into the mix, can they actually use it? Do they think it's safe? You know, we need to we need to look at all these aspects within our target audience because it's a very diverse audience. And there's been a lot of talk about diversity and inclusion. And we, we need to bring that in how we remodel the commute as well. I think that's really important. And there are a few things that we can do. And um, I've taken I've taken some of this. My thumbnail. I've taken these sort of loosely from a paper that um, we co-authored with a company called Motion Tag. They do um, behavior focused analytics within a mobility context. And um, the paper is called Measurement and Incentives, the Key to Reducing Carbon Emissions with Mars. It hasn't been published yet, but what we found is um, that we need to put a lot more focus on um, safety, for example. So when we talk about focusing more on cycling. Cycling needs to be safer. And we can look at other countries there, Germany, Denmark, the Netherlands, who've traditionally invested into cycling infrastructure for decades. And it is so much easier. I used to, I grew up in Germany. I used to cycle to school when I was 12, 13, and it was perfectly safe. If I look at cycleways in the UK, I don't know. They're just not as safe because the infrastructure hasn't been built. And um, it's similar with, with public transport. There's a big lack of um, accessible infrastructure here. So we need to retrofit, we need to train, we need the right policies. We need far more investment into making infrastructures accessible. And we have to stop using the excuse that, oh, we're dealing with historic um, buildings and we're dealing with historic train stations. And it's really difficult. And I think that's really, a quite bad excuse. We can send people into space, but we can't make a tube station step free. I mean, that's just a question of priorities, right? But if we really want to get people out of their cars, and I'm also talking from personal experience here. So I live with reduced mobility. I can walk, but not very well. My balance isn't very good and I can't really walk steps very well if there's no railing. I'm quite slow. So very often I resort to taking the car because it's just easier and safer for me. And I know I can get from A to B in my car safely, conveniently, and it's fully accessible. And um, I don't have the same experience with public transport. That's a real, at least not in the UK. I do have it in other countries, but not here. And that's a real problem. And again, for public transport, we also, if we want to make it more attractive for a larger audience, a commuting audience, we need to look at safety a lot more. Um, Women feel very unsafe on public transport for good reason. Um, there's a lot of harassment that, um, that they have to deal with on a, on a daily basis. And that needs to be addressed because, again, that's another factor that might push women to, women to use the car rather than take public transport when their shift is finished late at night. And um, we, we already talked about lift share. So shared car use is a fantastic example on... on um, how we can solve traffic problems, but it needs to be addressed on a lot more varied levels. So 
another example from my personal circumstances, I live in an apartment block at the moment in Bristol that um, has probably about 180 to 100 um, parking spaces. And only one of those spaces is allocated to a car club. Why is there no better policy that makes it obligatory for apartment blocks like this to offer more um, car club spaces? It would be perfect for this. So there are all these sort of little areas that we need to look at in order to make the commute more attractive for a variety of audiences. And this is where mobility as a service comes in, because you can see here, we're talking about a lot more multimodal way of traveling. So we're using different modes rather than just the car. And you know, I'm not sure why my screen's not. Oh, here we go. And this is where the, the mobility as a service promise comes in. So mobility as a service really tries to achieve to, to offer all available modes to the consumer where they can plan, book and pay those modes within one, one environment that's very user friendly. And that's also individualized. So with our technology, we can already offer people the ability to prioritize their routing by um, carbon emissions, for example, if someone says, I don't care so much about speed or cost or time, they can structure their, their trip results and their routing results around making lower carbon trips. We can structure them around um, step-free routing, for example, where we have the data, we can look at crowdedness as well, which is something that, that was really highlighted during COVID. And um, we can really make travel and, and the commute a lot more individual and personalized and also localized because we integrate all these new modes like the micro mobility modes, um, the shared bicycles, the scooters, uh, we can tell if something is accessible or not, if, if we get the data, obviously. So I think mobility as a service can be a really good um, tool to, um, to, support, to support lower carbon commuting because it gives the user more power and more information and knowledge. And so this is what we do. And there was a project that um, our partner company MotionTag did, did in uh, Münster, for example, in Germany, where they took that mobility as a service promise and they added incentivization on top. So um, people could collect climate points and then exchange those for um, certain incentives uh, within the Münster community. And that worked really well. And that actually saved a lot of CO2. So if you put mass together with um, incentivizing and what we call nudging, it's, um, it, it can really create a better transport system and a better commute for people. So it's not the only solution. But I think it's a really important tool to have in that, in that toolbox to improve commuting towards a lower carbon future. And yeah, I look forward to your questions at the end of this session. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, that's great. If you could stop sharing your screen, yeah. Sandra. Yeah, I'll just hang on. Just lost my mouse here. No worries. Oh, here we go. Yeah, re really interesting. Uh, I think there's a number of questions around MAS and, and, and kind of understanding kind of, you know, how successful com have, has it been in the UK up until now and, and how do we change that? So uh, we can certainly dive into that when we get to the Q&A session. But thank you for that. Very good. Georgina, uh, I'd like to hand over to you. Thank you. Hi all, and it's Georgia, by the way. I always get Georgina, but there's no N. <laughs> it's just I Georgia. I do apologise. for the country. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, nice to see everyone. I'm Georgia Yexley. I'm Head of Cities at TIER. Um, I've been with TIER for a few months now, um, from the early days of our kind of London operations, uh, probably the most exciting and complex uh, micromobility projects I've ever had the good fortune to work on. Um, but I've been in micromobility for a bit over six years, I think now, which is a bit of a veteran uh, in the industry, uh, being such a young one still. Um, so let me just quickly share my screen. And I, I should give a little bit of a disclaimer 
before I begin that I've just joined from an earlier panel where I've been beating the drum that the green kind of economic recovery of our cities isn't exclusively about the commute to the office but it's also about getting to places of worship and a lot of the things that actually I'm going to be echoing what Sandra has said um you know going to do your shopping, going to grab a coffee with a friend. These things all actually do play a really important role in the decarbonisation of transport as a whole. It's not just about the return to the office. Um, so I'm trying to shift my mindset towards still thinking about commuting and talking more about commuting. Um, but to echo Sandra again, I think it's really just a false approach to think about decarbonising the commute as relevant only for everyone that was at home instead of the office through the pandemic. Um, in, in many ways, um, taking on board the importance of going into that detail of how different groups need to travel to work and what work is and, and how you leave work and trip chaining and all of the really great things that Sandra says so I won't kind of um, repeat all of that um, but alongside the impact on those that have continued to commute throughout the pandemic um, and the, the decarbonizing their forms of, of transport as well. Um, so our health and our care workers, essential workers, those in the hospitality, construction services, transport even, you know, we also need to think about how we're decarbonizing their commutes. It's not just about the office. So I just wanted to start there um, as well, then framing it around that. Um, and also just to, again, another disclaimer for my um, <laughs> presentation here, um, but as a transport method, um, you know, we provide multi multimodal transportation to cities um, and I'll talk a little bit more about here and how we do that. Um, I'm going to be focusing a little bit more here on how we ensure that we are doing that in an environmentally friendly way, in a sustainable way that's decarbonising the commute in the methods that we put forward. And I'll, I'll try to touch on a little bit more as to how we capture the commute, uh, but hopefully that will come through in the Q&A um, as well. And um, I've got the scooter here. While I've mentioned that we are multimodal, we operate e-bikes, we operate e-mopeds, um, and new and novel ideas are kind of coming through. And I'll talk a little bit more about maybe some of those surrounding innovations. Um, I've, I've put the e-scooter here and I've kept it kind of front and centre in talking about decarbonising the commute and how we're doing that, because I think it is the most controversial and talked about in terms of, is it really green just by being a, a greener form of transport? So I'm going to talk more about how we make sure that it is. Um, so on to my next slide. Hopefully that's coming up OK. Um, so a little bit more about TIR. Uh, TIR is the leading micromobility operator in Europe, uh, meaning that we are the largest and we're really helping people to move around cities. Um, and I've put it at the bottom there, so I come to it, but first of all, just in terms of the scale, that we're talking about so um these numbers are way out of date um they are always out of date no matter what i do to try and keep um you know when i send in slides to give the the best bet at what they're going to be next week but i believe now we're well over 135 cities and if i look in my inbox it will be probably more than that in 14 countries um, and certainly the numbers below uh, will have increased from there, um, but very much about uh, moving moving people around cities. And I think to Sandra's point, um, and actually every, every panellist here, um, we're doing that in a way that is very much about collaboration, integration, partnership at the city level, but also at the wider transport mix level. So um, I'll try and shed some light on that. Um, and really importantly at the bottom there, we're doing this as uh, the first and as a climate neutral micromobility operator. Um, so I'm going to focus there. So sustainability at tier, um, this is just the cornerstone of the business. It's been embedded um, from the outset. Uh, this is not about offsetting or going backtracking over damage made, but actually from the outset of the delivery of the business and the creation of the business we've been investing into sustainability throughout that's through our supply chain um, that's looking to every element of our impact how we operate our logistics using e-vans or e-cargo bikes the innovations that we're bringing forward the multimodality and the integration with the wider public transport mix so there are many kind of creative partnerships that exist within that um, or even really exciting ones like with organizations like Nunam who work to extract energy from our batteries that can maybe no longer take an e-scooter from A to B uh, but can be extracted and become power banks to support developing nations so you're really compounding that positive impact when you're looking at not just the vehicle and the mode itself but also all of the surrounding components to how you operate as a business 
Um, and our logistics mix, I think, uh, you know, really key part of how we run services. I think a point that is often made about how green these services are is how we look after our fleet, how we, um, you know, clean them on street, how we maintain them, pick them up, bring them back in, redeploy them. Um, I've talked about using um, e-vans and e-cargo bikes, really important. Um, and, you know, also um, really thinking about just the way that we do that. Um, utilizing data to make sure that we're not moving around where we don't need to be moving around. Um, but also how we calculate this is really important. You know, we're we're basing, and that framing of, of being climate neutral, we're basing these calculations um, on our logistics, not just around that, but also um, how we move our spare parts, how we transport the vehicles from where they were, um, uh, manufactured to where they're built to where they're ridden and um, everything is based on these kind of real real metrics um so really importantly um but also there's innovations that um i would love to show you. i don't have the, the video on here today but if you have a chance to see um head over to youtube and put in tier energy network um so bringing forward new innovations that help us reduce down our footprint and the logistics that we have on the street so uh, our tier energy network and the swappable batteries that we use on scooters and e-mopeds and e-bikes enabling user swapping um there are a ton of other benefits that come with that in terms of accessibility the return to the high street and, and other areas that are really important for our uh, recovery uh, our green recovery um but also that reduces down by enabling our riders to swap and incentivize them to swap uh, that reduces down our need to be on street and moving them around ourselves as well um so on to the next slide you know how is this in in, in practice in terms of i've talked about um we've set up tier from the outset to really be focused on on environmental impact and it sounds very romantic but our founder Lawrence Lauschner was backpacking through Patagonia and seeing firsthand you know the, the devastation of climate change and came up with this idea of, of, of tier um, and wanting to, to bring forward um, micro mobility in a way that had thought about impacts from the outset um, he was previously founder for a company called Rebuy that was all about the reuse and repair of, of electronics as well. So um, very much embedded in our uh, DNA. Um, and I think it's really um, relevant to say that, you know, at the founder level from the leading from top down, that, you know, lots dedicated his entire stake into climate impact in the business, into climate impact that he has no financial benefit from so our mantra of change mobility for good isn't just a kind of nice sounding tagline it's really about driving that that mode shift and that change um at, at a really great scale um and from a personal point i think you know every move i've made in micro mobility over the last six years has been massively formed by a founder that has a true vision and mission so um, a really massive reason for for my joining too as well so what does this really look like in practice for our hardware? I think the hardware is just the point that um, people are the most interested in kind of really understanding how can you be climate neutral, all of the things that come in the supply chain that we started to talk about, that often there are really wild statistics thrown around about the lifespan of e-scooters. I think I've heard, I got an email the other day saying they only last for three months, which was a surprise to me. <laughs> but there is a new paradigm, there's been a lot of investment in developing these um, really long lasting, durable um, methods of transportation. I think we still have some conflation in the world of e-scooters between private e-scooters and shared e-scooters and the, the type of um, services that we operate, um, but ours have been developed to have a lifespan of up to five years. Um, with that, that is really importantly about how we look after those vehicles, the maintenance, the repair, how they've been created um, and built to be able to allow that. Um, but also we're looking at circular circularity in in how we're putting our systems forward um so you know where maybe i talk more about kind of our reuse and recycling practice at tier um you know the first thing that we look at 
when a scooter is decommissioned is evaluating the case for reuse. Um, and in this case, we've already resold, I think it's over 10,000 scooters um, in this second life bracket here, um, where we've refurbished them either to B2C or B2B clients that are maybe looking to, to help their employees move around uh, in more sustainable ways again. Um, and on that case, we, I know in the UK, and I'm sure that we'll have some questions around the difference in Europe versus the UK and legislation and regulation. We're not uh, putting forward my tier yet. Um, there are still uses for reuse and recycling as well. Um, so yeah, reuse for repair, you know, we also evaluate, can we repair them? Can we reuse components to repair other scooters? It's a really important aspect. And then finally, recycling, you know, when these above options are no longer feasible, uh, then we'll disassemble. Um, and that's where we're talking about um, partnerships where we have the different material categories I think we have aluminium steel plastics there are a number of materials but they are, can be broken down to recycle the full body of the, the scooter as well and that goes all the way into the actual cells of the batteries that we're using with those partnerships that I mentioned uh, previously and so I think everybody so far has spoken about the importance of where we sit now in our cities in how people are, are moving in them but also the collaboration that's that's a part of this and we're able to put forward systems that really add value to cities only when we do have that kind of deep embedding into the cities that requires that partnership sandra talks about mass at tier we have 40 plus mass and public transport integrations so it's really about enabling that trip chaining we've it had pilots even in germany where we've provided ticketing for trains in our own app there's all the amazing things to talk about mobility hubs and but even it's just about making uh, the service available so in london that's really meant making sure that we're working collaboration with the boroughs that we're in and tfl to implement parking bays and have the physical access to the system uh, outside public transport in residential areas and really assessing who is able to access our service and, and what the barriers are and lowering those barriers. Um, this requires on every level kind of tailoring a tailored approach to each city. Um, to Ali's point actually about I mean, not being led down the wrong path by the data. Uh, in London our approach absolutely isn't just about a kind of one-for-one -one replacement for cars. Uh, about 50% of households in London don't own a car. Um, so it's, it's not uh, as directly um, just one for one replace that trip and you're therefore creating a better impact on the environment. It's about, um, you know, is somebody walking five minutes to a bay to collect an e-scooter that's then going to take them to a train versus, um, you know, calling a cab or jumping in their friend's car these are all really valid points as well so the the, the kind of headline data and aggregated data is not always the best method for us to understand how we're really going to decarbonize the way that people move we really have to get into the weeds and take that tailored approach um, and yeah the, you know it'd be remiss not to to say that um, there has been a, a real paradigm shift in our cities uh, post-pandemic um, and that all of these changes, you know, we're mentioning a few things here in this slide that are really about kind of infrastructure changes within the city and um, efforts to move away from the private car um, in, you know, implementing cycle lanes, at short term, long term measures. Um, but all of these things are relevant to also implementing micro mobility systems that work. So here we're talking about London uh, implementing the, the ULES, the ultra uh, low emission zone, and how that's actually coming at the same time as we're trialing and implementing the, the largest and most well connected micro mobility service that the city's ever seen. You have to provide people options and you have to give them reasons and encouragement to utilize those options and focus more on the benefit, uh, more on the benefit I, as we possibly can um, then it does add to people's lives i think there's um a lot of focus particularly in the e-scooter space and in micro mobility at large on risk mitigation and how to make sure that people are safe from um, and then we often miss all of the things that it adds and all the benefits they adds and all of the actual improvements that can be made to people's safety and the way that they move around cities by access to these these transport forms so that is all I kind of want to give in terms of kind of high level, what 
what is tier how do we operate what's our headspace i think the really important takeaways are you know really embedding this at sustainability and decarbonizing at every level um, as a transport provider uh, integrating with other forms of transport really getting into the weeds and digging into the data and tailoring to the city that you're in to the people that you're trying to serve and then you're going to be able to to really make that shift towards decarbonized transport thank you Georgia, thank you. Uh, really interesting. You can't get away from it. Micromobility is, is a booming industry. Uh, you won't have seen it, Georgia, because you've been busy presenting, but there's some really healthy debate going on on the chat around uh, e-scooters and, and, and micromobility in general. Uh, we'll, we'll come on to that when we get to the, uh, the questions. We're answering questions as we go, uh, but we will get to the Q&A. But, but I'd like to now introduce Natalia and ask Natalia to, to kind of share with us what Octopus EV are doing uh, in this commuting space. Natalia. Hi everyone, thank you for having me today. Uh, first off, I just want to say how in awe I am of all my fellow panelists and everything you're all doing and the insane data that you've provided today. I'm going to uh, caveat up front that I am not a commuting expert and therefore I cannot provide the expertise that some of my other panelists have been sharing. Um, but what I can talk to you about today is what we're doing at Octopus um, to uh, accelerate our journey to net zero, uh, both from a group perspective and also from an Octopus EV perspective. Uh, I have been in the electric car space for about six and a half years which like Georgia makes me a bit of a veteran uh, in this space because it's just not been around that long. Um, and I've been with Octopus Electric Vehicles uh, two and a half years and actually the group business has only been around five. Uh, so for a fair bit of time. And as head of propositions, I look after what we sell to our customers within Octopus EV. I'm going to share, uh, I think it's three short slides. Um, I realize that we've all given you a lot of information. I'm going to try and keep it quick and then we can go to Q&A uh, and answer all the burning questions that I'm sure uh, the people watching have. So let's have a look. It's, hopefully this will work. Yes, it will. Okay, Octopus Electric Vehicles, who are we? Uh, so hopefully you've heard of us. If you haven't, we are the uh, electric vehicle leasing arm out of the Octopus Energy Group, and we exist to make the switch to uh, electrification, so electric cars faster. We want to make it easier. Um, we want to make it more accessible, and we want to give people a place that they can trust to get advice, not just about going electric, but also everything that comes around it, right? So their energy tariffs, their charging infrastructure, how it all, all works and give people the confidence to make that switch. Uh, uh, why? Because ultimately this is zero emission travel. Now I am with all of you. Uh, uh, we need to reduce the number of cars on our roads. We need people to share their cars more. We're already seeing a shift uh, in consumer behavior and how how they perceive car ownership, i.e. I don't need to own a car, I just want to get from A to B, but in reality, cars are always going to form a part of the way we travel. We just need to make sure they're as clean as possible. And that's the bit that we are trying to tackle uh, through Octopus EV. So where do we come from, right? Why have you got an EV leasing business born out of an energy retailer? Uh, um, ultimately, we were born five and a bit years ago um, to do a couple of things. So we like, uh, in the Octopus uh, group of companies, there are many types of companies in our group. We like disrupting tradi traditional industries that have historically underserved customers and overcharged them. Uh, the energy retail space was uh, very much that. There was a handful of very big companies who did that. And it, in reality, if we want people to uh, understand where their energy comes from, understand what that carbon footprint is, we need them to be become more engaged consumers. And that's kind of what we've done. So we've put technology and customers at the heart of what we do. Um, and so over that five year period, as a group, we now have over two and a half million customers in the UK. We're in seven countries. We've bought a whole load of generation assets. So it's not just about selling electricity and gas to customers. We also own a whole load of solar and winds across Europe. And it's about matching those solutions and offering consumers greener solutions that offer them better pricing, which rewards the grid, which works for the environment. And as a result, electric cars was a natural place for us to look at because these are batteries on wheels, which we can harness, actually help get more renewables onto the grid. Um, but we needed to accelerate that. We need it to happen faster if we want to achieve our net zero goals. 
which is where Octopus Electric Vehicles was born out of. And I have uh, stolen this stat from Ali and the team uh, because I love it and it's now in most of my presentations. Uh, um, but ultimately, Octopus EV is here to just to give people that confidence, right? So what I was talking about at the beginning, you come to us, we make it super simple for you. We can finance your vehicles, we'll bundle it with a great energy tariff, which I would say is a renewable energy tariff, um, which tends to be smart. So we encourage people to charge out of peak to not put strain on the grid. We'll also provide you with the right charging solution, whether that's home or in the public domain. And we've got a team of experts that support you through that and provide you with independent advice. Now, why is this, what impact is this really having? So. In the context of commuting, you know, our business focuses uh, on the B2B segment. So we sell to companies. And why do we do that? In reality, because that is where the low hanging fruit is today in our market. Uh, uh, company car tax rates are really low for electric cars. And therefore the uptake of electric cars is happening within that business segment. And salary sacrifice, which is essentially cycle to work, but for electric cars, is huge and that's kind of our core product which means that we are speaking to companies of all sizes you know we'll deal with any you know we'll deal with an employee base of five employees through to you know, our largest clients 9,000 employees and when you start speaking to businesses where they are looking at their travel plan where they are looking at their overall carbon footprint commuting is a huge part of that uh, um, and actually through meeting uh, Ali's team and actually we we work um, with the left lift share team um, you, you get to understand the impact that uh, zero emission vehicles can play within reducing that carbon footprint piece. But then you you kind of, um, I guess, join that up with something like lift share, and it becomes really impactful, right? Switch everyone into a zero emission vehicle and then get them to share their cars and bring people with them to work is can have an amazing impact. So that, I guess, from, from our context is where we're playing today in terms of... Um, the, I guess, the commuter emissions. Uh, um, we're not here to put more cars on the road. We're here to switch the ones that need to be on the road to electric. A lot more can be done in that space. Uh, um, and ultimately the engagement that we're now having with employees means that we can have much broader conversations with them. And actually uh, some of these conversations have inspired me to uh, think about some of the bits that we could be doing with some of our customers uh, to encourage them to actually go uh, greener faster. 